there, uh, it, what you've heard up here, and especially in my case, uh, they could have done a lot more damage uh, in permanent damage to our weapon systems, um, and, and they didn't. All, all of these weapons, in, in my case, were brought back up on alert. Um, it, it took a day or so, but uh, everything was fine. Um, if they wanted to destroy them uh, with, with all the uh, powers they seem to have, I think they, they could have done that job. So uh, I personally don't think that this was a hostile intent. Hi, I'm Charles Stone with the Tiger News Service. I didn't ask my friend to come up and uh, make that statement for me, but uh, appreciate your patience. Uh, I've published internationally in the history of weapons of mass destruction, interna uh, including going back to the 1940s, and these incidents go back to, the, to at least that, that period of time uh, that uh, U.S. government and military facilities that were doing high-tech development in that period of time also reportedly at least had uh, UFO uh, uh, visitors of various types. Uh, and that uh, there, are re there is uh, archaeological evidence that there have been uh, what we would call uh, that, that there's uh, evidence of what was, was almost certainly uh, atomic uh, warfare in, in ancient history, at least to, to twice. And uh, also that I'd like to mention that one of our biggest and most powerful government agencies uh, was founded in part to, to monitor uh, UFO activities. That was the National Security Agency in the, in the late 1940s. Did you have so a question, sir? That, that, are you aware that, uh, that, uh, that the, the uh, NSA was partially founded to, uh, uh, be, to, to monitor UFOs? I've heard rumors to that effect, and also the Central Intelligence Agency. In my view, those rumors aren't supported by any authoritative documentation at this point. I would not be surprised at the same time if that were ultimately proved true by historians, but that's as far as I think we can take it at this point. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is John Kelly. I'm a columnist at the Washington Post. Colonel Halt, um, you mentioned that when you went out you had a... Uh, um, a cassette recorder, a Geiger counter. You said a camera. Camera, 35 millimeter camera. Did uh, so. Um, <coughs> first of all, did you take any photographs? And second, how does a cassette tape uh, made by you, presumably for official purposes, end up at a cocktail party entertaining guests? Okay, two questions. Let me answer the first one. The disaster preparedness individual I took along, Tech Sergeant uh, Monroe Nevels, also worked for the base newspaper part-time. He was a professional photographer on the side, had a degree in photography, had his own dark room. In fact, when he left the base, we had serious problems because he painted one of his rooms with flat black paint. And we had to redo the paint about four or five times. He took numerous pictures, pictures of the indentations, pictures of the broken branches. He tried to take pictures of the objects in the sky. He took the film back home, and it all came out fogged, unfortunately. Now, he did it in his own darkroom. I used to have a darkroom and dabble in photography, too. He could have done it himself. It could have been a radiation, which I have doubts about, or something could have happened that we don't know about. But anyhow, the film all came out fogged. Uh, Sergeant Penniston had a camera. It was not uncommon for the security police on the perimeter to carry cameras because the British have a lot of, we call them bird watchers, people that catch tail numbers and follow the history of airplanes and climb over the fence from time to time, not to do any damage or any harm, but curiosity and try and get close, it's part of a game. So we would, if they did that, we would photograph them inside the fence and turn them over to the British police. Sergeant Penniston took his film to the photo lab and turned it in, and they told him it disappeared. I can't answer that. The other question, <clears throat> what was the other question you asked about the... So did you personally have a camera that were taking I did not. I had the micro cassette recorder. We, uh, keep in mind, we were just in the process of transitioning to word processors in those days, still using the typewriter. Our secretaries were very resistant to getting involved in modern technology. And so what I would do, I carried one in my pocket, a little Lanier, and we had the big Lanier machine in the office. And when I went around the base, I'd note, you know, the fence is damaged here, this needs to be painted, whatever was going on. And I'd come back and give her the tape, and she'd type it up for the staff meeting the following week. So I just thought, well, I'll take the tape recorder along because I don't want to take notes. It's cold and windy, dark. So I took my tape recorder along. It was a little micro cassette one, those little tiny ones. I still have it, by the way. 
I came back, and after the tape was played at Third Air Force, and I played for Squadron Leader Moreland and several other people, Ted Conrad, my boss, then say, make me a copy. So I made him a copy. He put it in the desk drawer, in his desk drawer. He moved on and it was replaced. And the gentleman that replaced him thought it was hilarious to play the tape. I didn't know this at the time at cocktail parties. So he was playing a copy. A copy of that copy somehow or other got to a gentleman by the name of Harry Harris, a British uh, banister or a lawyer. Harry was an uh, amateur ufologist. He and a guy by the name of Max, uh, Mac, Sa Mike Sachs. I traced this down years later. And a couple of ladies named Brenda Butler, Dot Street, and Jenny Randalls, who were writing a book at that time, all got involved, and my tape got out into the public domain, a copy of my tape. What's on the Internet now is probably a fifth, sixth, or seventh generation, but it's out there. So does that answer your question? Thank you. Let me interject that Robert Jameson, the missile targeting officer from Malmstrom in 67, does need to catch a plane, and so if anyone wants to direct a question to him, you'll need to do it in the near term here. Hi, Ledge King with Gannett, Washington Bureau. I have a, three questions, two of which can be answered by raising a, a hand. Uh, the first is, have any of you been contacted uh, in the last month, I guess, whenever this event was being planned, by a government official telling you not to show up or trying to dissuade you? Any of them? Any of you? No. Second question is, um, Mr. Hastings alludes to the fact that there's a message being sent here that we ought to get rid of nukes. How many of you subscribe to that theory? That, that, that the theory that, that you support getting rid of nukes, first of all. I, I don't think he said that. I, well, that what 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 you're being asked is Bob and I are of the opinion that the, the the bottom line is the best explanation for what has taken place at our nuclear weapon sites is that whoever are in the UFOs are in effect sending a message, perhaps getting rid of nukes, expressing displeasure or concern, but certainly uh, indi indicating an interference with the weapons. You're being asked whether you subscribe to that or not. Do you support? Not quite, not quite that, to no. that degree. I, I yeah. think they're modernists. Sure we don't Do all of you support getting rid of nuclear weapons? I'm, I Show of hands. Not well, okay. <laughs> uh, can I just add? Sure. Um, uh, with regard to uh, there, the, the reason I came to the conclusion that the, this was a message was simply, again, um, they could have done a lot more destruction, I think, uh, to our weapon systems, and they didn't. Uh, it was simply uh, shining a light on our nuclear weapons, and literally, literally shining a light on, on, on nuclear facilities. Uh, this has happened all over the world. I can, I can point to other instances where UFOs came over, shone a beam down on the weapons storage area where nukes were, were stored. Uh, to me, it's pretty clear. This is just you know, we're, we're shining a light on this, we're pointing it out. Uh, what are you people doing with nuclear weapons? And my final question, uh, which does require somebody to speak, <laughs> uh, is, you know, you've talked about how society and the, and the mainstream media sort of are very dismissive of all this. Can one or two of you talk about sort of the personal journey you've come to in terms of, um, you know, approaching family or friends or others about this uh, when people may think it's kooky to talk about this. Can one of two of you talk about how, you know, how, was it difficult? How difficult was it? Um, that sort of thing. Thank you. Well, as a person who is very, very skeptical about this, what I call UFO nonsense, uh, when that happened that night and I thought through the process of what the logical explanations are, after that, I was very careful about who I told what, because some of my friends, when I started on this, just laughed. Uh, so I got ridiculed. I, you know, I was used to the ridicule from the Air Force, except for the, the dual standard. We're going to ridicule, but it's secret and don't talk about. And, and coming out was, was my... I came out a little bit. I, I talked to Robert. I gave him a little bit of the story. I didn't want my name to come out. I was concerned. I don't want to be considered a kook. I don't want to, you know, because I consider not so many anymore, but I consider some of the extremists a bit kooky. But I think it's more 
important that we come out and tell our story rationally and see that we aren't kooks and this is what happened and make your own judgment but I am one of my concerns is that you all think I'm a kook and I'm old enough that I don't really care that much because <laughs> it happened so is that okay how old are you 68 okay. going on 95 <laughs> I would briefly add to that that uh, I made a decision decades ago that no matter who laughed at me or threw things at me, I would speak what I knew to be the facts. Uh, the world is filled with self-appointed UFO experts, uh, persons who have all the answers, even though they've studied none of the facts. The scientific community is chock full of those folks. Journalism, frankly, is chock full of those folks. Uh, we're presenting credible witnesses for open minds, people who have an objective sense of their duty to inform the American public about the reality of the situation. We're providing you not only these witnesses, but many other witnesses who can testify as to the reality of all of this, and you may draw your own conclusions. I'm Lisa Fan from Epoch Times newspaper. Uh, my question is towards uh, uh, Mr. Arnison. Uh, you mentioned someone over there trying to send us a message. I wonder what kind of a message. Uh, do those aliens consider our Earth people uh, have a threat to them, or they just try to uh, uh, defend, or they try to come here to occupy, take over Earth? What kind of a message do you think? If I knew that answer, I wouldn't be here. I really don't know. <clears throat> but they're, they're trying to tell us something without a, without a question, whether it's don't go much further, you could get rid of the things, I don't have any idea. Are they from the extraterrestrial? Who knows? Are they from other dimensions? Who knows? Are they from underneath the Earth? Who knows? Your guess is as good as mine, and I can't answer that question. Anything else? Um, the government are trying to uh, conceal this uh, information, the, the fact, actually, for many, for all those years. Do you think this would do good for the society's stability or is it kind of a, a prevent for some uh, advance or further research uh, for our society? No, no, that's a, that's a big one. We have been lied to for so many decades about the truth of the matter and I think we need to have more openness in society as far as what these things are. Recently, in the last year or two, the Catholic Church has said publicly, you know, it's okay, ETs can exist. There are brothers, and they are theologically saying it's okay to believe in extraterrestrials. And if the Catholic Church says it, it's got to have a big stick, I would think, as far as the Western world is concerned, anyhow. Do you think right now it's a time for human beings to admit there are other spiritual beings in the universe besides the human race. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I think that's... Um, the thing is, people are so wrapped up nowadays in their own world. They're worried about jobs. They're worried about mortgages. They could care less about UFOs and ETs and paranormal events and whatnot. That isn't even on their radar scope. Unfortunately, but that's... I understand that. I haven't spoken to college students that much myself, but I understand that that is a fact. Yeah. And that's healthy. I think that's goodness. Oh, yeah. I just wonder, I just wonder what's in the archives in uh, the Vatican as far as UFOs and things like that are concerned. If that could be released, wow, I bet it would blow the socks off a lot of people. That would be interesting. Okay. <laughs> let, Sorry. let me, let me, you, you, you asked what would the potential changes be for society, would this be good? Let me briefly summarize and say, um, in 1975, a former CIA official, Victor Marchetti, wrote a best-selling book called The CIA and Cult of Intelligence. Uh, the CIA took him to the Supreme Court to attempt public, uh, block publication of that book. 
Ultimately, a redacted version of it was released. It was the first book in American history to be censored by the U.S. government. The same Victor Marchetti.